Harry S. Truman Library at Independence, Missouri, is the scene of an historic event. President and Mrs. Johnson and Vice President Humphrey arrive for ceremonies that will make the Medicare bill a part of Social Security coverage. The new bill expands the 30-year-old Social Security program to provide hospital care, nursing home care, home nursing service, and outpatient treatment for those over 65. Medicare will become law on July 1st, 1966, and for Mr. Truman, an historic souvenir from the president. No longer will older Americans be denied the healing miracle of modern medicine. No longer will illness crush and destroy the savings that they have so carefully put away over a lifetime so that they might enjoy dignity in their later years. Well, the catalyst for Medicare was pretty simple, which is that you had elderly people who couldn't afford care, and they hovered between being bankrupted by getting care and waiting until they were too late in their disease to be effectively treatable. The challenge was that people wanted to be sure that we were paying for good health care, quality health care. The Quality Improvement Organization is there to support and facilitate the improvement of health care, whether that be in a doctor's office, whether it be in a hospital, whether it be in the home. So looking at the data, making plans to assure that an, a particular intervention would work. And then when you find those interventions that are most successful, you look to spread them from one place to another. So that if I, no matter where I live, I, if I live in Massachusetts, if I live in Texas, if I live in Washington State, I'm gonna get comparable care and that it's gonna be fair and that it's gonna be equitable. So what started off was what were called professional standards review organizations, and they were devoted to assuring that care met the best professional standards, and they primarily did so by providing some education and by looking at specific episodes of care, especially ones that hadn't worked out well. The the process there evolved into a very large and systematic review of medical records. And that was uh, a, a marvelously antiseptic way to approach healthcare. And then we really evolved to PROs, which were physician review organizations, and it really reflected reviewing cases uh, kind of still on the individual care level. When it became a PRO, then it merged into more of a state-based organization, frequently organized by state medical societies. Well, the PROs focused uh, a lot on paper processes and utilization reviews and things of that nature. I understand that you have some questions about Ms. Dunn's uh, drug resume. Hi, Dr. Harris. My name is Elisa, and yes, I do have a question. Another milestone comes when serious amounts of data are collected systematically. In order to improve, it requires excellent information about how the system is functioning. We look for patterns that come out in variations that are reflected in the data. And what data basically said was, we're not doing as well as we think we are. We're not doing as well as we could. In 1994, the Institute of Medicine had just released, you know, a study and they wanted us to focus more on evaluations, formative evaluation. We had a process in which we looked at charts, but we did what was called implicit review. And we moved from sort of this auditing, random auditing of charts and following up on complaints to really doing targeted 
efforts around specific diseases and specific problems. Improving the management of common chronic conditions such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease and heart failure and build on those best practices to improve outcomes for our beneficiary population. We recognize that also the problem wasn't often related to the targeted disease, it was more about the systems. You have systems within which people provide care. And the systems influence what kind of care they get very heavily. So then there's the matter of the bell curve. The bell curve shows you very simply if you move the middle of the curve, if you move typical practice, you have a hugely greater impact than if you nibble away at the defective provider end of the curve. You've got the top part of a bell-shaped curve where the providers are performing best practices. You've got, in terms of the cluster, most providers that are performing around average, and then you have the outliers that are doing not so well. A lot of that bell curve reflects differences and inadequacies in the systems. As we begin to fix the systems, the curves start to come together. They don't come together at the average. They come together at distinctly superior performance. We were able to show that things had improved, but the fact that something was happening and you could measure it was a significant milestone in the growth of the program. Then the name evolved to Quality Improvement Organizations because that reflected the multidisciplinary approach of all team members, physicians, nurses, administrators, working together to improve the quality of care. The Quality Improvement Organizations have been the boots on the ground uh, in the communities, helping uh, the patients, the families, and the providers carry out local activities and goals that really roll up into national progress. And we've been able to do that in a number of very important areas uh, throughout the country. One out of every nine West Virginia women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Hello. I'm Hova Underwood, and those aren't just numbers. They're mothers, daughters, and grandmothers, just like me. The flu, it's serious business. Thousands of people die every year from the flu. That's why I get a flu shot. Get a flu shot today for you and your family. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stan Stovall, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast, CMS Journal, Volume 1, Pressure Ulcer Care. Reducing the incidence of pressure ulcers from about 8.8% .8 in 2003 to about 5.5% in 2013. The most recent example is in our collective efforts to reduce the use of antipsychotic medications for individuals who suffer from dementia and not just reduce the use of antipsychotics, but improve dementia care. We're gonna take a little walk. We've witnessed a reduction in 30-day readmission rates, and I think QIOs have been an important part of driving that uh, recognition, providing technical assistance and tools, uh, as well as sharing best practices to achieve that goal. A very important change occurred when the name of HICFA, Healthcare Financing Administration, was changed to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. But it was not just about a name. It was about making the organization more responsive, more transparent. You've seen every year uh, CMS open up, become more engaged with patients, and with providers in a much more interactive uh, way. When Nursing Home Compare came out, there was tremendous anxiety and concern. No provider really had had that level of public reporting, and um, it was the first time the QAOs really got into nursing homes. We publish every month on our website, Nursing Home Compare, 
a multi-dimensional set of ratings for nursing homes that uh, provide much more transparency to the public, to families, to individuals who are looking to be able to discern differences in quality, make meaningful distinctions with regard to which nursing homes are available for them. Gradually, the agency developed additional Compare websites. ESRD Compare allows consumers and the public to gain more information about dialysis facilities. There's been tremendous expansion of the Hospital Compare website, constantly refreshed, expanding the array of information that's available to the public. Because the consumer is more educated, it also forces providers to step up and meet those expectations. The QIO program has evolved in being able to establish stronger partnerships and being more collaborative, not only with their stakeholders and their actual regions that they actually serve, but also between each other. Ideally, what you'd like to have, those that are performing high quality work, working with those that may be having challenges and those that are not succeeding as they would like to, because then you can begin to share information of what worked and, and explore whether it would work in another setting. Back in 1999, about 19 to 21 percent of nursing home residents were restrained on a daily basis. Gradually, we've all worked together to reduce that down to 7%, down to 4%, and most recently down to 3% in 2013. That is tremendous progress, and it was only possible by the alignment in a common objective. You got a good haul, Barbara. Learning and Action Networks were developed in 2011 at the start of the 10th scope of work in an effort to bring together like-minded individuals around achievement of a common aim. It is a mechanism and a collaborative force to bring all the stakeholders together who have the same common vision and focus. For me, collaborating with the QIO has been a, a tremendous help in, in providing care. QIO has helped us focus, I think, our, our efforts a little bit better, providing us um, resources and learn kind of best practices. What, what can we learn from other people? What can we gain from all of us working together to, to reach a common goal? Getting all of the people at the table and creating this opportunity for everyone to be heard and for the best solutions to come forward is extremely exciting. Within the 10th statement of work, we really began to look to see what's going on throughout the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, what were the priorities there, what was the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality working on, what was CDC working on, how could we work together on those types of things. Then we reached out to the private sector and really aligning all of our efforts so that we could change the healthcare system. The National Quality Strategy is the roadmap for how we are going to achieve um, excellence in, in health care. And uh, it fl flows, of course, from the three-part aim. The idea that population health was the goal, along with individual health care experience and the affordability of care, was just a change. The ESRD network program is a program that's been in place at CMS for quite some time. I think the most exciting thing for me about the ESRD program is to see how now ESRD contractors are working on uh, quality improvement with the dialysis facilities. Which also is tied to the National Healthcare Quality Strategy. And so this work that the ESRD program is doing now is completely aligned with that, and that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think the National Quality Strategy is the grounding force for healthcare transformation. When we think about the term value as it relates to cost and quality, we begin to look at a number of the programs that have evolved, uh, such as the value-based purchasing programs and the integrated care and accountable care organizations. Value-based purchasing means Medicare not only paying for 
the volume of services, but paying for the highest quality of services. We are taking a process and taking it apart and looking to see where are the defects, where's the waste, how can we improve it, how can we make it better. And as we do that, then we gain efficiencies through that process. It's a never-ending quest for perfection. I see great transformation occurring every day in our healthcare system. I, I see that we are moving into a different era. We used to be in a in an environment where it was very much, you know, this is us and this is how we do things and now you help us execute it. But now it's, we need your feedback, we need your input. I'm Terry. I was diagnosed with invasive ductal breast cancer and I joined in the support group and I asked questions and I made comments and that led to discussions. And after the group finished, someone or some ones will come up to me and say, thank you for saying that, I couldn't. People harbor questions within themselves they don't dare to put out. There has to be a much better two-way communication between patient and treating physician, technician. It's speaking and hearing. If you don't speak, they can't hear. If they don't hear, they can't treat. Hi, my name is Jay, and July of 2009, I was admitted to the hospital, and I was told that I had stage three chronic kidney disease. We kind of had an idea what kidney disease was, but not really what it entailed. The doctor would talk to my wife about what needed to be done. She would talk to me and said, you know, you might need dialysis. Do you know what that is? I'm like, oh, yeah, I know what it is. It means my oil's getting changed. That's about as much as my comprehension of what dialysis was at that time. I feel patient education is very important because it helps the patient feel empowered, feel knowledgeable, feel more in control. So I think what excites me the most is our evolution to patient-centered care and thinking about them and their care as they go across settings. We gain so much information from the families that help us provide better care to their loved one when they share information. I realize mom isn't the same mom that you knew as a child, but there are still some remnants and it's so important to share that. The same with hospitals. It, it's important for them to know their little habits so that they're not saying, I don't know what to do with them. They're getting more agitated at this time of day because they're sundowning. If we can give a better report and let them know, you know, they're a late sleeper. Don't wake them up at five for breakfast. It provides individualized care. It's getting away from the cookie cutter care. I make dinner every night. What's good for the residents, we can do it. And, and if I know that I can do it, if there's a will, there's a way, I'll do it. <laughs> we can take somebody who will say, no, I don't want to go doing that. It's so easy to say no. And if you can get that person that stays in the room every day and get that person out and socializing and smiling and dancing, that's rewarding. We go out to eat, we go to movies, we go to parks, uh, we went to the art show. We do things here, not just sit here. What would we do if we were living at home? And that's really how we try to focus our care, is if I were living here, what would I want to do? But medical care, as you know, can be expensive. And if there were no social insurance, medical costs might jeopardize many a lifetime of saving and planning. With Medicare, our people can enjoy longer and happier and healthier lives. What a blessing for them and for all America. What excites me is, is the opportunity to uh, make these kinds of improvements 
across the entire country for millions of individuals and improve their quality of care and quality of life. And I think that you're seeing that throughout so many different areas of CMS work. I, you know, I went into the nursing profession to care for patients, and really I did that at the individual level at the bedside, and such a rewarding experience. But I never lost that sense of caring for the individual patient. So I think it comes together very nicely when you begin to develop policy for a country that you think still how it's gonna impact uh, your neighbor or your friend or your own family member. So I'm very excited about the opportunities that lie ahead of us as we really are just at the tip of the iceberg of how we're gonna bring patients more um, into our quality improvement activities. It really has the beneficiaries, the patients, the families who comprise our beneficiary population um, at the forefront of all that they do. Um, they exist to serve the beneficiaries to drive our health systems and healthcare providers towards try to improve the health outcomes of the beneficiary population. We've come a long way. It's a very different job from what it was to walk into a hospital 10 to 20 years ago and try to preach the gospel that you have to change systems in order to improve care. I think it's a wonderful thing what the QIOs do. I mean, protecting a frail and vulnerable population and looking for ways to improve quality of care. I mean, that's phenomenal. What excites me and what gets me out of bed and going every day um, and coming to work is knowing that I work on something very meaningful and knowing that my work really makes a difference has a huge impact um, in everything I do. You know, I really can't think of another group that I would prefer to work with more. We talk about a lot about the quality improvement and how the quality improvement has really transformed the whole nation in terms of quality of care. I think my favorite thing about the QIO program is, is that it is actually working to transform healthcare.